Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Claudio. I work for Amnesty International, and I work and research and mostly specialize on digital surveillance and targeted surveillance against civil society. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to try to speak very quickly. I have a little bit more slides than I probably should have. Um, and you know, what, when we speak about digital surveillance of civil society, there's many aspects of this. Um, the one that I particularly care about is targeted surveillance, so that the action of um, you know, hacking or uh, getting access in some way to activists, human rights defenders, and journalist devices with some particular purposes. And this is something that we see a lot, and it's kind of growing um, as, as a threat, as an issue, uh, significantly over the last years. And last year, particularly, we saw a lot of kind of high-profile cases that you might have heard about, um, you know, the most prominent ones being the cases of NSO and, and, and in Mexico and, and the, in the Emirates, where there was this big story about um, these iPhone zero days being utilized against some activists there. Um, and what I, what I want to talk today is not necessarily about these big cases that we get to hear a lot of the time, but just rather maybe what happens uh, behind the scenes and what happens in less known cases that we don't get to hear about very often. The first premise is just surveillance enables repression. You know, when, when an authoritarian, authoritarian state, um, you know, exercise control over, over its dissidents, the use of surveillance tools and use of surveillance technology is a direct contribution to this repression in the very first end. And as I was saying, we see a lot of this. You know, I, I spent some time mapping out all of the reports and all of the kind of discoveries that we had over the last few years, and most of them happened in the course of the last five years, really. And, uh, and I wanted to see, like, is this a growing trend? And, and, you know, this is pretty much just the number year by year of how many reports have come out from different outlets that speak about this threat of digital surveillance and targeted surveillance against the digital society, civil society. And what, what does this graph mean? It's just really not, not much. You know, we kind of have a lot of irregular discoveries and some are kind of more concentrated than others in a certain period of time. But what we can see at least is that there's just large blocks of, of pieces of research and discoveries that are initiated generally by one lucky first discovery. And some of them tend to be tied to specific countries. For example, 2012 was a big peak of discoveries and was kind of one of the first moments when this area of research uh, became really a thing because of the situation in Syria kind of intensified over in that particular moment. And 2016 was also a bit uptick because of all these big discoveries that came out. But this doesn't really show anything. There isn't really a trend. To me, it tells that this is a, an issue and a threat that always exists, and we're just getting to learn more and more about it right now. And there's two problems with it. One is that most of these discovery originate just from a handful of countries. We don't really have a lot of visibility about what happens from a global scale, but it tends to be very concentrated in the places that we have kind of direct connections. And one of the issues, and I'll get to that a little bit later, is most reports are just authored by a handful of people. It's, it's a very pervasive threat all over the world, but just not that many people tackle. And we kind of, I kind of break it up in what are these threats that we see, and there's a bit of a pyramid that I, that I kind of come, came up with um, where there is kind of a, uh, it represents kind of a proportion of what is the real technical threats that we observe and that we try to work against. And at the very top, we have these big cases, the ones that we really get to hear about often and that make a big kind of media splash in, on newspapers and so on. So those will be the cases where zero days are involved and like big companies and surveillance vendors are involved. And then there's like a middle stage where there is less sophistication but seems something quite prevalent. And the big corpus, the one that, that there are issues that we really don't get to hear a lot about are the less interesting one are the less technically sophisticated ones. But they're la the large majority, in fact. Um, and this, you know, has is good and bad news. Bad news is there's very sophisticated, you know, and resourceful people and attackers out there that really invest a lot of money to, to surveil individuals at risk, surveil activists, journalists, and human rights defenders. And that is a problem. That is, of course, a critical problem that we have to talk about and deal with, also perhaps on a, from a policy perspective. Um, the good news is that, you know, in numbers, the large majority of people and the large majority of attacks that we see are actually not that very sophisticated. They tend to be pretty basic technical tech tricks and, and, and techniques that are utilized all over the place. But that is also bad news, because we're still failing hard at counteracting these issues, despite being quite basic. And what I'm even more concerned of is that there might be an even bigger kind of bottom of this pyramid that we just not really never talk about, which is a whole other dimension of threats where physical surveillance comes in, online harassment and online intimidation. And that even something that we hear even less, more, less often than, than others. 
One of the big problems of all of this is that this pyramid is also kind of indication of where is the interest in the public, where is the interest in the media, and it tends to concentrate all the way to the top of this pyramid, where the only cases that really get to the surface that initiate some debate are the just exceptions to the, to the norm. And the very bottom ones tend to be forgotten or not even much, much talked about. And that is a, that is a problem because, again, that is, those are the cases where a, lot, a larger number of people get affected by. The very bottom, we have cases, for example, we, we worked on last year of uh, fake NGOs and kind of uh, weird trickery that is being set up to approach people and just talk to them, not even hack in any device or attack them directly, but just to get to learn information about their activities, perhaps de-anonymize if they're uh, activists operating anonymously online, or in some cases just trying to figure out where they're physically located. And this happens a lot, and we just never hear about it. The largest portion is what I was saying, kind of credentials phishing, just attackers that are just trying to get access to people's email, to Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts. This is the just large majority of it. It's a trivial issue, it's a trivial attack, but it just happens all over the place. And this is another example that it's, you know, pretty common you know, type of phishing attacks that just goes along with a lot of social engineering where people chat up with, with individuals from particular countries, try to befriend them, and then at some point you know, send them away to, to, to get targeted with some sort of credential phishing with the sole purpose of getting, getting credentials out of them. And you know, in the last year alone, even if we, again, we never get to hear about it, we have seen, and me and you know, the community generally, hundreds and hundreds of people being targeted. It's a massive issue um, that we're just not tackling successfully. So just phishing, phishing, and so much phishing. It's trivial to orchestrate. Again, it's just the purpose of it, creating a fake kind of login page that might look familiar to the victim with the sole purpose of getting access to its credential. It's very easy to pull off. There's a lot of uh, free and some commercial kits that are available online to do these kinds of attacks. And with appropriate social engineering, it's also extremely effective. You know, often we speak about, uh, uh, I, I, I speak about the issue of blaming users for falling for these kinds of things. The, the truth, the truth, the truth of fact is that when there is enough kind of incentive in, in, in making people believe in the, in the kind of, uh, social engineering that is being used against them, it's extreme, extremely difficult to tell apart from legitimate behavior. And in most cases, especially when it comes to attacking human rights defenders and journalists and so on, this is often the most effective tactic. You know, when you need, need to target people like those, what you want to get out of them most often is just identify contacts, colleagues, or sources in the case of journalists, learn about their plans, their communication, or even impersonate them to further attack others. Um, and this is just, you know, as much as you need to, um, you know, uh, give them trouble, really. There are still cases, of course, where we see a lot of malware attacks. They're still frequent. They tend to be a little bit harder to pull off. These are the cases that tend to surface a little bit up to the attention of the public. But most often, as I was saying, they're rather unsophisticated. Um, you know, most of the malware that we see, kind of malicious software we see being used against activists and civil society in general, is extremely basic. It's probably the worst pieces of software that you'll ever see if you do technical analysis. And still, they're effective. And still, they're good enough. To, to achieve a certain goal. And that, to me, is a bad sign also, because it means that either we're failing from implementing appropriate technical security controls, or just we're failing at finding ways around that and make the people safe. So what can we do about that, and what do we, do, do we try to do? The first is kind of using media exposure as a tactic, and that's where I was getting at. A lot of this is research, getting research out for the public um, to learn about and somehow expect that things will just fix by themselves. And it can be useful in some exceptional cases, especially when these cases involve big companies or uh, surveillance vendors that are uh, a little bit shady, or particular countries that might be you know, interesting or hot at this particular moment in time. It can be useful to increase cost of attacks. What we do sometimes when we publish about this stuff is not just to tell the public that this exists, but the, through the virtue of publishing, we manage to kind of destroy that operation at some point and make it a little bit more costly to pull it over and, and, and do it again and again. For the large majority, um, you know, activists getting hacked isn't much of a story anymore, which is also makes it hard to come here and talk about it again and again. Um, it's always the same issue. It's always the same problem. And the problem is that you know, out of all these reports that we get to hear about, how many actually remember? It's just not that many. And so as long as the publication and coverage is the, kind of the driving force behind doing this kind of uh, surveillance research, we'll just keep failing all these people that just rely on us to, to, to keep them safe. And in terms of impact, in terms of actually changing things for all of these people, um, some of the most effective work is just done under, under the radar. It's just this most tedious and lesser known uh, activity from kind of the activist community that comes out. And you know, I always 
consider myself a researcher over the years. I just research these things. And at some point, the more I get exposed to the real dimensions of this problem, the real effect that surveillance has on people, especially people that put their lives at risk for a certain cause, I started realizing that it isn't really much about research anymore, and it's just really about helping people. And in terms of impact, again, some of this work can be extremely tedious. And there are some few good souls out there that do extremely boring work just to help people out. And we just don't get to hear about them, and I think we should. Um, some, some friends of mine, for example, spend every day, every morning, just going through all of these boring phishing campaigns to identify victims and, and trying to find any way to contact them and inform them that these things is going on. And it's, in numbers, this is actually a lot more impact than, than most other things. We love tools, you know, we build tools to make people more safe. Tools are important to a certain degree, they increase the, the, kind of the difficulty of performing certain attacks. Um, however, most often when we actually look at it, a lot of these tools come from, from kind of us as in kind of privileged Western communities that find some issues and trying to resolve them, and often these issues that we identify are not really in the model, in the threat model of the people that we really should assist. And also, attackers learn and adapt. They see what's going on in the tech world. They see what's going on in kind of the digital activism world and, and you know, move, work around it. And often, these technical solutions alone are not really uh, enough. So we need to get changes at a platform level. We just can't train every activist, activist in the world to use some tool for the resistance to learn about some you know, new kind of cryptographic uh, solution to a problem that isn't really their own. Um, and we need to, you know, if in some cases, for example, we equip them with the latest kind of end-to-end -end encryption technology, and then at the end of the day, we'll just get hacked by some office, you know, uh, PowerPoint macro or whatever other trickery that is available to any attacker that has a little bit of skills. And that is a problem that we need to, need to address. We need to attract more expertise. As I was saying, I started doing this work five years ago, and pretty much the people that were working on those, uh, on, on the, that are working on these issues now, are the same people that are working on these issues back then, and it's just not enough. There's a huge demand for this, for this work, for this assistance, for this research, and just a handful of technologies that are working on it, on them. And I hope that I really don't see the day when we get to the point where something like the cyber Bundeswehr or whatever else will just attract more hacker expertise to, to com compare to opposite to the human rights community. And then often, I think it's a trend that we're moving forward to. We need to distribute expertise. Um, basic security expertise needs to be widely distributed. We need to dilute this bottleneck. There's a huge activist community in the world, and a lot of the technical expertise is just concentrated in a handful of places, one or two or three at most, with people that you can count on two hands, perhaps. And this is just not enough. It's just a bottleneck. I've, you know, I've swamped with stuff to look at, and I just don't have time for it all, and just the same way all of my colleagues. We don't have a lot of visibility right now. As we're seeing, a lot of the attacks that we see are attacks that come just from the same places just because we established some presence in that country. We created some networks and some contacts, but it's just not quite enough. And we need to move away, I think, from this concept um, that you know, we're working within a digital rights uh, environment. We need to move into the, a broader audience and move into placing this expert security expertise in human rights uh, uh, organizations, LGBT rights organizations, environmental, indigenous, indigenous rights communities, and so on, to make sure that we're there at the right place at the right time when something bad happens. And we just not do that quite enough. We tend to segregate in this weird kind of digital rights bubble. Um, with some assumption that somehow everything will fix themselves and everybody will enjoy the results of our work. And, and lastly, I would say we need to stick together. We, we can't afford to be territorial or hyper-competitive. The digital rights community tends to be a, bit of, a little bit like that. Um, and, and that is a problem, because then we're not going to be effective in helping all of the people that, that really need some help. And the only way to succeed is cooperate and leverage these human networks that all of these human rights communities and whatever rights communities have. There's a large presence of organizations all over the world that are facing these exact same issues that we just don't, and we just don't see them. Um, and many are paying a hard price for this activism. Um, you know, all, most of us can enjoy working out of a cafe in Berlin and, and like, do our own activism through the computer. And there's many others, and the more you get to learn about them, the more you get to understand the significance of the work that we do as a digital rights community, as a tech activist community, or whatever you want to call it, where they put in their self out there, and they're putting their freedom and their lives out there in service of some other cause, and often the failure of the tech community, failure of, kind of the security community, and some failures of our own too, could cost them really, uh, really hard prices. And so to conclude, I think I don't really have much time left. Um, I just want, to, just want to remind you about some of these cases. And I remember about Basel, Hamad Mansour was the key kind of 
element that allowed all of these and so in, in the iPhone zero days, um, you know, uh, cases to come to light. Um, and just because of his bravery in this, and, and also witness in, 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 this, in realizing that something like this was happening, a whole dimension of other issues in many other places got discovered. And Hamad, as it is now, is still in prison in the Emirates, uh, largely because of this activism and also because of his online pretty much activism. Ali and Peter, some of, some of you here probably know them personally, uh, and all of the other activists in, in Turkey that have been arrested in the last few months, they're all paying this price for this same activism we're, we're, we're so committed to, and they're still in prison right now. And so just the same with, with many others. Um, so that is to say, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's many people that are doing great things and are paying good prices for it. And that is to me my kind of call for you to say, if you have some expertise, if you have some tech skills, if you have some other types of skills, just keep, uh, think about and put it at service to some of these causes. And with that, I thank you. Um, I know it's a bit of a condensed uh, kind of overview of what's happening, um, but at the end of the day, you know, surveillance is an issue that will remain. Um, it's not an issue that will go anywhere. Um, it, it, if anything, it intensifies as the general kind of geopolitical situation in the world worsens by, by the day. Um, and you know, we need to attract more of, these, more of these expertise, more of these people, and just try to help each other out to make sure that people don't fall um, for, for the same mistakes again. Um, thanks a lot. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to learn more about the details of what type of work we do, um, and if you might be interested in getting into this kind of field, please, please catch me later, and I'll explain you all more in detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudio. Um, so important to put things into a global perspective, I think, and not just talk about uh, these issues that we're discussing here on a German level. Um, of course, raises another level of sadness also on these topics. Um, are there any questions? We have two or three minutes left. Um, if there are any questions to Claudio, you can raise your hand or come up to the stage. Um, very often, I'll ask a small question. Um, it's maybe not the easiest one, but you know, very often, like this complete feeling of disempowerment for activists based in countries where we still have a relatively safe um, frame of operating, uh, with other friends sitting in jail. So you mentioned Peter, for instance, right at the end, and. Um, it's so often hard to say what the right thing to do is. Do you make a lot of noise? Do you reach out to your parliamentarians? Do you, you know, how, how do you behave in a way that is not going to endanger your friend? I'm not expecting you to give like a one-size-fits-all answer, but are there, for instance, people at Amnesty or other organizations that you can recommend where we can call and ask when in doubt in such cases? Well, it, it is a difficult question, and it also depends on what are the specific you know, conditions of, of you know, that particular case in that particular situation. We all try to do our best. Um, as you know, kind of digital rights activists, sometimes we don't get the influence that, you, that we might want. But that's exactly what I was meaning at. We need, we need to move out of this bubble, I think. We need to get into kind of these larger kind of global issues that are not necessarily just about the internet. The internet is a tool for most, and we, we treat it differently, and it needs to be treated differently. But in, 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 this, in this way, in all of these other kind of dimensions of activism, as it might be human rights and environmental and so on, suffer the same issues as we care about, um, but they just are not equipped to, to respond to this properly. Um, and so the, the, the only way forward to responding to this problem, make sure that we can assist in a way that is most effective, I think, is to find exactly those places and not to just operate from a pure kind of isolated digital rights perspective, um, but look into kind of the effects that this has in, in other parts of society that we just don't get to see very often. So of course, Amnesty is a bit of a self, kind of a bit of a pitch for, for my own organization, but there's many others that work in, in very critical situation. And what I learned through the process of working in an organization like that is that there's a lot more that you just did not know about. I, and you get exposed to a lot more that you just never could think of before. Um, and and that, to me, is critical because um, you know, again, um, that is just the only way to make sure that we can be at the right place at the right time to make sure that situations like some of that, that, that you've mentioned just don't happen again or don't have the same kind of impact and the same damage. Um, so, you know, call up Amnesty, call up Frontline, call up all of the organizations that you can think of, Human Rights Watch and whatnot, has them and see, you know, um, maybe even locally, is there, is there something that I can help you with? right now that, that might you know, best leverage the expertise that I have. And it might be a critical moment for them to actually leverage you and change something in practice. Um, so that is kind of the only, the only thing that I can think of 
Um, everything else is, uh, is kind of contextual. I think that is a very good call to action and a good uh, point to end on. So let's have another big round of applause for Claudio. Thank you so much for being here today.